First of all, let me sort of inter- just introduce myself, which isn't necessary. I was born in Derry on the 7th of the 3rd, 1929, so I'm 87, okay, and lived there until the late 1960s. I had a perception of life from living in the village that gave me an outline of what was required to improve a better society that enhanced the working standards of people so that they may be better treated. What I'd like to do is speak about 1930, first of all, when I was not only a schoolboy, but a a bad, developing, uh, well, teenager then. Um, What I recall, first of all, is that during the, the early 30s, or the latter part of the early 30s, I was asked if I wanted a job in a barber shop. It was called Di Phillips. He had a son, Gethin, and a daughter called Mary. Um, this was okay because what happened was you get a free haircut and you'd also get, I don't know, eight me or a penny for doing the two nights rubbing and lathering the faces. Now, I must have been a bit rebellious at that particular time because what happened was there used to be a chap from up the mill called Tom Morgan. And every time I lathered him and rubbed his face like that, he moaned and groaned like old boots. So what happened was that the one night he was moaning and groaning, I put the brush in his mouth. This, of course, caused a lot of trouble, and I barber gave me the sack straight away. So I had a sack from the first job that I had. I was 12 years of age then. Another thing that um, amused me when we were teenagers in Derry was that uh, most of the dairy boys had pigeons. So they used to send them away in a lorry and they'd all come up and fly back. Um, Now we found out that the pigeon fanciers used to have a tin with corn in. So what us boys did, we had a tin with not corn in but making a rumbling noise. So we had a heck of a row over this because apparently when a pigeon comes in, you've got to take the ring off his foot and put it into a clock when all the chaps in Derry were late because we had distracted the pigeons. This is something that (laughs) amused us boys but of course because there was a couple of bob behind it for winning this pigeon race, it wasn't very happy as far as the boys were concerned. The other thing that stands out in my mind and it's not difficult to remember it but the effect that it had on some of our mothers and fathers a chap in Kevin Road called Charlie McLaughlin. Now, Charlie dammed the river opposite um, Chopper Street, down the bank, and dammed the river there. So as soon as it was finished, then, of course, all of us boys jumped in, was uh, quite happy there until we came out, because the duff that was coming out from the dairy washery actually changed our colour, and we were all black in colour which wasn't very pleasant when we went home because our mothers and fathers uh, wasn't happy about it. The other thing that um, I can remember is the sports day. And what us boys decided to do is when it came to the egg and spoon race, we put a little bit of glue um, on the egg, won the race, but of course they couldn't get the eggs off the, off the spoon. So it was quite a pleasant young life then living in Derry at that particular time. On Sports Day, oh, we created absolutely a lot of trouble because we always interfered with the judges or like we call football referees today. We always said that the answer that the judges give was wrong and we weren't happy with it at, at all. Christmas time, we used to always go to a place that was called the Jug and Spoon, the Jug... <laughs> In the, in the Darren Hotel. And what happened in there was that the ladies were in the jug and bottle, sorry, they were in the jug and bottle. They'd be quite happy by the time they came out of the Darren, and we used to be there with our hand out. We didn't get a lot of money out of them, but it was substantial, the amount of money that we were getting. Um, so that, again, was something that I'll never forget as far as uh, we were concerned. The one thing we couldn't understand was that the school did call it a dairy mixed school, but you could never mix with the girls because there was a barrier between the boys and the girls. So the boys played in one yard 
and the girls played in the others. So we objected to the headmaster, and I can tell you what, Davis gave us a key and all for objecting about the way he was running the school. Um, this worked out in the end anyway, because I've been to the school since, and there seems to be a general consensus of opinion that it's okay for boys and girls to mix, even at a young age. The one thing I've also remembered very well about 1930s was the hobnail boots that we had to wear. Now, I remember my father buying, I can't remember what size it was, so he said in the shop, Elvin, try these on, try them on, and then, of course, he bought a size bigger and put some plastic paper down the front because you'd never wear those hobnail boots that were. But I can now realise why they did it at that particular time or in that particular way. And um, it always stood out for me anyway, uh, the poverty that was there. But of course we were all poor. We wasn't just one family rich and one family poor because we were all poor. Um, I remember Davis speaking to me, who was the head teacher, and saying, listen, Edwin, you've got to concentrate more on your educational system. So I said, well, I don't know, Mr. Davis, as soon as I finish, I want to go up to work in one of the pits. Yes, he said, that's all right, but there may be something after the pit for you to look at. So I went back to the school and stuck in for um, doing my report right. And thank goodness I had three firsts. I'm not showing off, but I was lucky. I was lucky enough to get three firsts. So, of course, when I went up to Ogilvy to look for a job, they uh, discriminated a bit, I think, against the other boys because I had the job as messenger boy, not as one of the chaps that worked on the screens or worked, you know, um, underground. I was too young in any case. But the one thing that it did do was help me after I left school. Um, the other thing I couldn't understand as a youngster until it was explained to me by some old miners, the hooter used to go. There's a lot of people who might remember what the hooter was like, but remember now, 87, I am not 27. <laughs> so the hooter definitely stood for something. Because in the morning, if the hooter went, my father knew that there was work. So he went to work. If the hooter didn't go, he then had to go on to a thing called the Lloyd George. I don't know whether people have ever heard of this, yeah. but if your wages fell below a certain uh, amount of money, then what happened was that you'd get Lloyd George, which was a couple of shillings, I think, to supplement the thing that was actually um, the basic wage at that time. <laughs> Another thing is the cooperative in Derry used to be down where the fish and chip shop is at this particular moment in time. And every year, we boys and girls used to queue up for Evan the Quops, we called him, to basically pay out the dividend. Now, the one thing that frightened us to death, Evan had a glass eye. There's no doubt about it. Now, when he wanted to go out the back to pick something up, what he did, I'm sure it was a not a, a glass marble then, rather than his glass eye. He used to put it on the counter and say, now if any of you move, I know because I've got my eye on you. It wasn't until years after I knew he didn't pull his eye out, but it was a, a glass marble. Um, I got to complain about the punishment which was made to us. Gosh, if we only whispered the wrong thing, hold your hand out, we tried horse hair, or hold your backside out, and that, again, you couldn't put a book down there or anything else because he'd recognise it, and you'd have six of the best, and if you try to avoid doing the sort of things that we're supposed to do. Dancing lessons was a good thing as far as us youngsters who were coming up was concerned. But, of course, the only thing we could do in the top hall in the Institute, the only thing we could do was to look in to watch them dancing, and, you know, you'd be of your nose against the window and think, oh, how oh, I'd like to get in there. But we weren't permitted until we got to a, an older age. Now, I've seen in the minutes somewhere about the baptizing pond, and there are two points of view, apparently. Now, I, I um, did some research, oh, about a fortnight ago, 
And the baptizing pond where I was, there's a road that comes down from Fosarevo. I'm not sure whether that's the right way to pronounce the farm. Fosarevo. Fosarevo. Fosarevo, is it? And a road that used to come down from the four roads and one that used to come up to, from Derry. And in that hollow there, there was a baptizing pond. Now, there was a woman I met from Fothergill's Road in um, Neutradiga. She's an old dairy girl, but her name is Mrs. Parade at this moment in time. I can't remember what her, her surname was then. And um, they substantiated to me anyway that there was a baptized in Ponder. They may have got it wrong. Only I noticed in the minutes that there was something about us having two baptized in ponds in dairy. The other thing that um, caused a lot of laughter as far as we were concerned, as boys anyway, we used to go to Bari and you were threatened immediately the trip was on. The minister, quite frankly, would be threatening you from that day until the day that the, the trip to Bari. And one or two families, and I've got a, an uncle as a matter of fact, who's called David Morgan, and he lived in Groys Farn. Now David Morgan had about 20 kids. And the deliberate thing was that when you went to Bari, lose some of the kids, never mind how much, never mind how much the, the chap was saying, when Mr. and Mrs. Morgan come here, they got five of the children or something there, looking for their parents. But of course they never <coughs> went because the kids were being fed well. And the other thing was that um, They'd always go up there just before the train was due. But um, to me, Derry had been a, a, a great place. The only thing I'd say that, and I was in the Bap Baptist chapel, there was always an argument between the deacons who should lead the parade. And I thought, well, heck, here we are, all supposed to be Christians, and there's fighting going on. Who'd lead the parade, whether it be the church, the Welsh Baptist, Bugler, and all that. So uh, eventually, in any case, they used to, they sorted that out, and I think the church led for more than a, a couple of decades. Um, Dairy Mick School, to me, um, it gives me a lot of things, and the one thing that I've used in industry, and not only in industry, but in a lot of the positions that I've been fortunate enough to get, and I know better than anybody else in the village because if you look at Colin Williams, who lives in School Street, when you realise what Colin did as a, as a pupil in school and at what positions he got in society, then you'd be amazed. Now, another boy that was exceptional, and I only knew his father as Czech, he was a little short chap check he was and he lived in Brecon Terrace. Now Brian had a tremendous brain, a mathematical brain, but he was snaffled by one of the oil companies the moment he left school, one of the um, local um, secondary schools. And and the more now I'm going into into history of Derry, the more I'm getting confused as to why some of these people haven't been recognised. Colin Williams, he met Mr. Truman for a couple of days and he held, uh, he met at a meeting and he was given the right to organise hands across the sea. Hands across the tree was bringing the American states back into um, more of a uniform situation than anything else. He also went to the Nobel Prize um, um, situation in Norway and Brian spoke on behalf of one of the people who was being accepted then for the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize. But it's, it's so important, I think, that we keep the history of Derry because it's a little village, all right, it's never been all that big, but the value of the people that have come from Derry have been so important, not only to our lives, but it's so important to the effort that I've put now in a bit of a paper I had to do for someone is dairy. What's it all about? Principles, efforts and attitudes and values. And if you use that to, as a criteria or as a yardstick from when you start, then you'll find that that's very
prominent as far as dairy people are concerned and there's a friendliness about the village that you can't help enjoying and shouting hooray I'm glad I come from dairy. A lot of people just say to me dairy where's that mm. and I, I got to explain to them you know where it actually is because if you come to the viaduct when you go up to the other side of the valley everybody knows Brista, Turfill, Pontlotin, sorry Brian, Pontlotin and Rumney everybody knows about it but dairy seems to be in this claustrophobic sort of situation as if everybody shut the gates at the puzzle out and uh, left us outside. So that was my youth anyway. If I can now move on to the position as far as um, the war was concerned in 1940. Once the war was de declared, September 1940, uh, 39, all the boys thought, well, this is it. Now we'd be able to see the Germans and fight the Germans. And do it. We were only 12 or 13, but at least we, we had the right sort of opinion. Um, I left school in 1941 and I was lucky because of my school reports. And I was as wicked as the rest of them. Now the dairy boys that all grew up with me and I put their names on the back. Uh, these boys, Kid Lice John, Billy Stevens, Selwyn Carter, Henry Hopkins, Norman Hughes, Norman Edwards, John Hopkins, Malcolm Cook, Isloin Richards, John Hughes, Glenn Oliverfield, Billy Dyer, Darren Th Geraint Thomas, Cyril Stephen and myself, and Tell Rin Oliverfield's in, in the front. I got some more of these copies for everyone to have a look at. But, um, you know, we were wicked and yet we didn't do anything that was destructive. We, we never destroyed anything. Um, so what happened next, of course, was that the vacuees came in. <coughs> oh, God, this was a, a situation that was meant for the boys in Derry because once the vacuees came in, we thought we'd be able to play tricks on them. The one thing that I got sick for, and there's no doubt at all about Mr. Davis's cane, I still feel it today, is that when the siren went, because a lot of the vacuees came from a place called Sheerness, and my son-in-law is from, uh, no, my, my daughter-in-law is from Sheerness, she married a chap called Geoffrey Thorpe, um, you know, and she stayed after the, after the war. But we had, we had some canes through the evacuees coming here, because we used to tell them, you know, we had a little box as a gas mask case. And of course, the, the people from Sheerness, when, when the siren went, they said, have we got to put our gas masks on? And all of us said, yes. But of course, you had some now with the kids walking about with the gas masks on, and some who didn't. But it, we served our sentence or were punished very much for it. Oh, and the other thing I remember was once the home guards, the ARP wardens and the fire service all started getting their uniforms. God, there was a different attitude to us public individuals or us mortal individuals. Uh, the home guards in particular. Now, the home guards used to come home and they had a paper explaining them what semaphore was. Of course, as kids, we were reading better because they didn't have the education that we had. So we knew more about semaphore than the, than the people. No disrespect to the old guards, I think they did a fine job of work. But what we were able to do then, say they were going to a top mountain, then when they got on top of the or when they were going up there, we used to have a little thing called a bomb that used to let off a cap. And that, of course, used to distract them. And because we knew the signals now, we used to give the wrong signal to them. And we only had a stick with a white bit of cloth on it. And the home guards would be in one place and they should have been in another place. But of course, it was boyish pranks that it, that it was all about. But we enjoyed it in any case. And what um, I still say to some people, though, they say, oh, when it's time you met your maker, oh. Um, you know, it's, it, it was a time which was very pleasant. 
you know, I'm a Christian and I know the Bible says three score year and ten, so I've had 17 years of somebody else's life as well, <laughs> but I'm enjoying it anyway. Um, but the uniforms, oh God, once they dressed them up full, there'd be a gun and a bayonet looked at, and every time you move, they used to say, halt, who goes there? They knew us very well, but that's what they had to do, so we fell in with that anyway. And again, we caught a bit of a hammer in. I think it was Trevor Lawrence handing out the stick that day because some of us or some of the boys had said, oh, it's Fritz or it's Fritz or it's Heinrich. Well, they said, <laughs> when, when Trevor Lawrence got to find out about this, and of course he was younger than Mr. Davis, so he could put a bit more oomph into the caning that we actually had. But it was it was a pleasant time, and even the home guards, you know, even they performed, and we made fun of them and joked. They were a good set of fellas, and they were all either working in the pit or somewhere else, because the army boys had now gone away. Um, but again, with the with the home guards, you know, there always used to be this argument about who should lead the parade and because they had better uniforms they thought they should do it. The one thing us boys found, there used to be a chapel at the end of School Street. We sat on the wall and I think an old First War soldier called Bill Davis was Hilda Davis or Aunt Percy's um, uh, father because they kept the grocery shop down here where Jarman's was Hilda. Um, but in fairness, they, they all took it in good part. But I got to mention this incident that took place up at the chapel. What the old guards used to do was hang a sack of straw, and then they used to charge this as if it was a German, <coughs> stick the bayonet in, pull it out, and then go down. Now, one of the boys who came home from the army loaned him a bayonet and, a, and his rifle. What happened? Of course, he was complaining. He wasn't rushing quick enough or wasn't sticking it in the German quick enough. One of the chaps got over enthusiastic and stuck it in the blasted tree. <laughs> so what happened then was, oh, this chap was sweating because he said, well, well I go home and I've got to tell now the officer that was in charge how my bayonet and gun got damaged. I don't know how he got off, but we never saw them borrowing a, a gun after that. The, the other thing was, they had to go to Porth Call now to fight the real troops, or at least that's what they were told. God, it was a set to in Derry because they were going out as old guards all dressed up, rifles shining, bing shining, shoes shining. But what, what went wrong was they were crawling up the sun in Porth Call, and when they come back, none of them wanted to talk about uh, the exercise. So some of the people from Derry said, well, tell us what happened. Did you win? Did you lose? Or were you OK? But what had happened, of course, was that the sand had gone down the end of the barrel. So now when they went to fire or something, whoosh, the barrel <laughs> opened like a banana. <laughs> and there was murder again with the home guards. Of course, we always blamed Joe Elms or Barker or whoever it was because... Us boys didn't care as long as they haven't a bit of fun out of it. But um, I, I still think, you know, that Derry was good. I remember that during the war, we'd get a message back. And I don't want to name names. We'd get a message back that somebody had been captured or somebody had been shot or somebody had been done. And I'll never forget one of the boys that lived opposite us in... Um, in Cambrian Street, there was a HMS Repulse, and it got sunk, and uh, as a result of that, he lost his <coughs> life. But you know, there are lots of people who've given their lives in the First War and the Second World War, and I don't think we pay sufficient respect to them. I was going through the, the library and the statues in the school, and there's some chap called T.J. Evans, but he lived in Vochrew. The only one I can find from Derry is Mr. Duck, as you know. 
and I told told you people you heard about this. Uh, but never mind what we thought about them, they were doing their best and they were practicing in fairness regular. Some of them would be working in the pit in the day, practicing in the afternoon. Some of them would be working in the pit in the afternoon, they'd be practicing in the morning. But we let them awful dance and I feel terribly aggrieved about this because they didn't know as much about the semaphore as we actually knew. So we were sending them down New Road when they should have been going up Mill Road or something like that. It's, it's, it was only a simple thing, but it was so important. I, I know that they were, they were guarding one particular farm road and some sheep were coughing and they run back to below and said, oh, the Germans are up in Kumsavig or wherever it happens to be. And he was laughing about it, don't be soft, he said, there's no Germans that come here. So when they found out, of course, that it was a sheep, but you can show uh, what I learned they were on and how efficient they felt they're from safeguarding the people of Derry from, from the Germans. But again, if you look at some of the people that have gone from Derry who've actually made a big career of the army, I know Ron Stokes that lived next door to us in Cambrian Street. He was a brigadier. Now I can't find anybody else who would reach that level. Eddie Davis, who was in the Air Force. Um, Graham Crockett, who was in the Air Force. Um, Dallas Davis, who was in the Air Force because he became a commercial pilot after that. And uh, the one that I find missing was a boy called George Garrett, who lived in the street uh, running behind the, um, the uh, what's the name of the pub up the Bargain. top? Bargain. 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 Yeah, the Bargain. 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 And, and Bargain. Bargain. Well, George uh, made a, a, quite a name for himself in the Air Force and yet never hear that name mentioned in Derry. I tried to make it a thumbnail report about them two particular years. And what I've actually done as well is I've brought these photographs now some of these are of the own guards and I've written all the names on the back. I've done this thing about Derry because when I talk about principles, efforts and attitude, there isn't a village around, you know, that have uh, actually done as much as what people from Derry have done towards every effort. So I've got those, Mary. Um, these are the boys that I knew. Now, I've also found out an old photograph, but I don't know whether Brian will be able to do it. But one of my pals was someone called Jackie Williams, who's related to Brian. He's on the corner here. And that was 1938 when they went to St. Athens down in um, uh, down in Barry. The other thing, and a lot of you may have seen this, I've made in 1920. This, um, oh, I've made a couple of these, or at least the boys in school have made a couple of them. Um, that's, that's the church mm. in Derry. And Judy Cullen helped me a bit, well, you know, Jill. So what I've done, I've written them down there. Don't take no notice of the writing, but there's quite a number of the old Jerry Church. And <coughs> this, again, was a presentation that was made um, to Mr. Lewis. And Mr. Lewis, I think, was the manager of one of the collies, collieries or one of the um, deputies. This, again, was a presentation that was made to now, I'm not sure, um, the girl Aris, what her name was? Vida. Vida, is it? Well, Vida, it shows Sid Evans giving um, Vida um, a grant or some money or something. The reason I found it in our garage was because my uncle dies on it as well. So I thought I'd pick it up and there's a couple there for whoever wants them to have them. The other thing is, on Mary Crocker, you know, was uh, the Carnival Queen in 1946 or 47. 
there are people on there I know. Um, the girl Johnson, Olive mm. Coles, the girl Sir Welling, and um, the girl that was living up here somewhere um, by the chapel. Of course, you've all seen this one. It's a parade in 1939 of the, the parade in Derry. But what, I, what I'm hoping it will do is at least give you some idea as to some of the things that I happened to dig out of the out of the out of the garage and Carol is over the moon about it as a matter of fact because it's getting rid of to her then who's not from Derry it's a load of rubbish but to me it's so damned important you know we, we can't blow hot and cold about what's wrong because Derry is a place that I'm glad I was brought up with and I've been very fortunate to have jobs where I can deal with it through industry through business, through the trade union movement, because when I was looking after um, Wales in the West, um, David Arica's wife, I think, Dillis. Now, Dillis was looking after the college um, lecturers, so I knew Dillis very well, and we worked together quite a lot on getting the rights and the attitudes. But it's... I can't say how important it is. The one thing that... I didn't bring with me is I've got some records and a video a DVD um, about our reunion in Derry but I felt so sad because I think there's only about two or three of us left that's Gwyneth Lewis in Hill Street as myself um, oh Mary Bynan she's called now not Mary mm. Carter and Glennis Davis so out of the 30 of us there's only four of us yeah. left, so we're all hanging on by threads to try to get as much information or as much um, publicity for dairy. And if ever there's anything I can do to help, I want to make sure that I'm there. Thanks for listening to me. If it was a bit rough and a bit crude, it's not because I want to be like that, because it's just that it's different speaking to school kids, because you feel the passion about the village. You feel the attitude about the village. I can name almost everybody that lived in the village during that particular time. And of course they all had difficult names because, you know, I was looking at number 18 New Road and it was um, Tom Morgan. I used to call him Lord Bomperon. Now I don't know why the heck they called him Lord Bomperon. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people shaking their heads. And I know that... Um, they used to call one chap called <laughs> called I tighten up. Now I knew him, <laughs> but this tighten up. Now I know tight. You did the nut on the boat. He'd say tighten it up a bit further, like. and it, it. You know these were the names. I Jean Jones was in our house, mm. and her father was living <coughs> in New Road, but I always knew him as number two, Jones Seven Brothers. You know you never. So if Derry, anybody came to Derry in the car and they ask where certain people live, you give them the false name. I go on all night, so I better shut up. <laughs> Thanks anyway for listening to me. Children today don't even know that that's the bomb friend. No. In Derry's oh. no. They well, don't call it that now, do they? I saw this Lord Bomper, and I saw the cricket team with Glyn Meredith, mm -hmm. um, uh, David Edwards, and there was Wally Bowen. Ava Perkins, wasn't it? Yeah. There was mm -hmm. Thunder and Johnny, who used to brawl spin, and I don't know who he was, and um, I know that Ron Stokes was the stumper, but there was someone who they used to call Thunder and Johnny. Now, Wally Bowen, I remember him, he was tall, he used to go fast, wasn't he? Yeah. Such a big fella. But it, when it starts coming back to you, you're bound to feel passionate about the blasted thing, because it's it's the seed corn, then, of this little village, or mm. part of the seed corn. And, well, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you.